I took technologies that already exist and just combined them in a way that nobody had really thought of because uh, we had this realization of what the ideal form of nanofabrication might be and we surveyed the landscape for what existed and what we could use and then put them together and as it turns out that involved taking elements from bi uh, uh, biological engi engineering all the conjugation chemistries it involved taking this new form of microscopy that ed had a, and um, his uh, students had invented expansion microscopy as well as these new ways of doing lithography in three dimensions which came out of um, initially biological imaging but then started getting applied to nanofabrication as well so you know, no one of those disciplines on its own could have done it, right? It's, it's really how things collide to create something entirely new. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are on site at MIT's Media Lab in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We are gonna be talking about light, art, nanotech. We have Daniel Oran joining us on the show, hello. Hello, how are you? Thank you so much for coming on, really appreciate it. Very grateful that Sarah Noosh Bob Canova introduced us. And we are gonna be unpacking a lot of great technical nuance in your work and also the applications of it. It was mind blowing for me trying to understand it in the short time that we had before this. For those that don't know Dan's background, he's a PhD student at MIT Media Lab in the Synthetic Neurobiology Group. He's an artist, scientist, and inventor who creates using both light both aesthetically and technically. And you can find his website link below, irradiantart.com, as well as his MIT Media Lab profile link. All right, Dan, let's start things off with our question that we like asking, that we find ourselves as stewards of Earth. What is your current take on the state of humanity? Well, I think I'm generally pretty optimistic about things. Uh, the trend line for prosperity has just been going up steadily for a long time, and that has not changed. Uh, there's definitely a lot of reasons for concern about the future and even about the present, but overall, I think you know, humanity will step up to the challenge and be able to address it so long as we're willing and able to really focus and answer and tackle hard issues that are in front of us. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Totes, there's a lot to tackle and we gotta come together, yeah, yeah to, to a, tackle. Well, the issue here is the coming together bit because yeah. somehow the technologies that connected us much more have somehow also <laughs> fractured us much more yeah, yeah. in some yeah, ways. Yeah, yeah the double-edgedness yeah. of it, yeah. <laughs> now, let's hit your, let's hit your journey. So, uh, Indiana born and then Massachusetts raised. That's right. And then how did you pick up your interest in light and art? Well, it all started quite a long time ago. Um, in about middle school, uh, I started working in a dark room and I just had some amazing mentors all through middle school and then high school and I just fell in love with that process of taking imagery, capturing light and then placing a piece of paper in chemicals and just watching an image appear. Uh, so that initially is what really um, made me fall in love with light. Yeah. And that process is <laughs> so interestingly you know, 200 years ago, photography came to came to life, and then uh, all the way up to actually leaving the the photo in in, in chemicals and having it appear slowly mm -hmm. for you. That was mm -hmm. very profound for you. Yeah. And now all the way to us having the cameras in our pockets. Uh, yeah, it's been a, a huge transition. Yeah. <laughs> huge evolution. One, you know, we've both gotten to witness. Yeah, so many digital photos now taken um, every single day. Now. When, when that aha moment you know, sparked for you, what was, what was your feeling about, about light and art when you saw that image appear? Um, I think it was just astonishment that you could take something, a moment from your everyday life and then just fix it and make it permanent, right? Um, and what's I think powerful there is the recontextualizing of an experience, right? Um, being able to take something that you imagined and then saw and translate that through technology and with your mind's eye to create an aesthetic or idea and uh, 
communicate that to others. Yes. All yeah. through light in one, and chemistry in yeah. one way or another. Yeah, now yeah. through also other forms of technology. But I love how you put it like a, pressing a pause button on a frame yeah. of reality and then being able to kind of relive that if you want. Mm -hmm. um, and in a, in a 2D, at least, uh, representation and eventually, uh, hopefully in a complete virtual immersion, potentially. Maybe. That would be, that would be nuts. Now, this kind of led you to Irradiant Art and you've been doing that for eight years. Yeah. Teach us about Irradiant Art. Well, I would say when I started going into college, uh, I s became... I wouldn't say bored with, but like disinterested in perform, uh, doing photography, which is purely representational anymore. And I really fell in love more purely with this idea of art and trying to create things using light and make artworks that are made of nothing other than light. Um, and that sort of led me on a path where I started studying all the f old photographic processes and masters and how they, how it was both um, an act of like science as well as an act of art in that they needed to know what they were doing, they needed to manipulate things chemically as well as with light and with the technology of the cameras themselves and it was, it was I feel like well the first medium um, where technology became intrinsic to um, you know the aesthetic. Yeah there's something very uh, profound about like you said, capturing these, these are called uh, irradiance, you call them coherent light. You're doing an aesthetic investigation into the wave nature of light. Yeah. These are gorgeous images of, of coherent light. You actually have one right there on, yeah. Uh, yeah, on your laptop. Yeah, like, right like this. Yes, and, so. and this, is, this is super gorgeous. And I want you to you know, explain this to us and we'll have some of these embedded as you talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so teach us about, about it. So I was really inspired to do this project, almost serendipitously actually. I was learning a little bit about holography and I had been uh, working in some of these optical um, applications for holography and I just started noticing, you know, when you messed things up, sometimes you get these really crazy forms of light just scattering out across the room. So instead of trying to make holograms, I instead started trying to capture those artifacts. Um, and the way I ended up making these is I actually would make optical elements. I'd blow these small glass pieces that mangle and manipulate and refract the light quite a lot. And then by passing a beam of coherent light through it, um, I could then capture those images directly onto film. But what's most interesting is that in using coherent light, it actually exposes the wave nature of the light because you can actually see the interactions of the waves just like you might see uh, ripples on a pond overlapping to create textures of like cross hatching and, and things like that. So you actually get to see that within the imagery itself. And then how are you capturing this? How, are these photons kind of just coming yeah, at these each are other? There's, these are photons coming at each other, but they're being projected onto a plane, and that plane is actually a very large piece of film. So there's no camera, but rather light just projected directly onto film. That is kind of crashing into each other, like, and then causing yeah, the Yeah, wave, yeah, yeah. So wave the waves effect. are doing that throughout the whole space. And I'm just taking like one slice, one slice of out that. of that. Yeah. And how do you capture that again? Um, I just use uh, the same sort of film that's used in the old, old view cameras, the ones where you put like a hood over your head, where there's like, there's a slider that comes up. Yeah, so what yeah. all I do is I compose what I want onto a piece of paper, essentially, and then I replace that with the film holder and then open it up and make a brief exposure. Brief exposure, interesting, yeah. interesting, okay. Okay, yeah, that, this, this type of, it's, you're, you're, you're taking what I think so many of us forget about, like the environments that we're in have light being exposed like in this mm -hmm. room all the time and they're flying around enabling us to see. Yeah. And well, that- A little bit more than that. Also, you know, the Wi-Fi, that's also electromagnetic radiation and you know these sorts of forms of waves overlapping and interfering with one another are happening all around us even though we can't see it 
And would you say that then the waves of things like a Wi-Fi and like the photons, are they kind of just like constantly in, like going by all past each other all the time in the Everywhere, spaces? Yeah. So within the oxygen and nitrogen that's here, there's also all of the waves of photons and Wi-Fi. And, mm -hmm. and then we're just, sit, we're as animals just sitting in Yeah, that. yeah, we're just yeah. being bombarded all, all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you would capture a like kind of like a still of what you know of what it looks like would it just look like like noise kind of how would it well i mean most of the radiation we're exposed to is incoherent so it it those waves are there but there's so many of them and they're not lined up so it all just looks it like blurs together but it's still happening whereas with a laser beam what you've done is you've lined all those waves up so that when they do interact, you can actually see these sorts of interference patterns occurring. Yeah. Interesting. So you could almost think about it that f like directly from the source of light, it's the most coherent, and then it becomes incoherent once it gets mixed up with all the other stuff. A little bit. I mean, most of these lights are incoherent to begin with. Yeah, yeah. It really takes you know, oh, a laser, laser. Yeah, a yeah. laser to be able to do that. Yeah. And then. And then is that the difference then between a coherent is a constructive? Yeah, coherent means that all the waves are lined up. Or all the waves are lined up. Yeah. And then the de and that's a co constructive interference versus destructive interference. So that's versus. when you, you, let's say you have those waves and you overlap them. Sometimes those waves will add together and make a bigger peak. Or uh -huh. sometimes they'll cancel out and there'll be nothing there. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So if the wave is propagated right next, right on top of potentially another wave, you yeah. could get the bigger peaks. And exactly. then if they're, if they're behind offset the, a little offset. bit, then it could cancel out. Okay. Okay. And so, oftentimes when you do this, you see both, you see them both canceling out and um, creating brighter peaks, which is why you see like these big ripples, especially when two waves come together in water. Yeah, yeah, they get bigger, they get taller. Yes, but then yes, in some yes. areas, you don't see anything. It's just sort of flat. Yeah, interesting. So that may be like when in the ocean, maybe two like, you know, 10 foot waves kind of like come together and, and make a, a huge, huge wave. 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 Exactly. Yeah. That would be constructive interference. Constructive interference. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, versus when they kind of cause each other to break apart. Uh, the, the destructive. destructive. Yeah. Interesting. Um, okay. so. Taking us all the way to MIT Media Lab, the last mm -hmm. four years here, you're pursuing your PhD in the Synthetic Neurobiology Group, and you're exploring nanotechnology. You're blowing mm -hmm. open the design constraints for nanofabrication with yeah. what's known as implosion fabrication. So teach us about what is like, you're were, you were blowing my mind with this, <laughs> like two, 2D nanofab predicated on the planar on a single plane versus 3D nanofab predicated on a volumetric deposition. Yeah, that's right. Um, so this project started quite a long time ago. And uh, what actually happened is um, I had been in photography for doing that professionally, just doing creating art and trying to show it and things like that. And then I reconnected actually with my high school friend, Samuel Rodriguez, who I started this project with. Um, and he invited me to the lab and introduced me to Ed, and Ed started letting me just start working in a dark in the la, in the wet lab rather. So I sort of like made this transition from darkroom to wet lab, and in that process, um, we ended up having this insight, which is um, based off of another technology from the lab called expansion microscopy, which was at the time a crazy idea that you can take a tissue. And in order to see it with better resolution, you actually just make it bigger, as opposed to trying to build fancier and fancier microscopes to try to see below um, the diffraction limit of light. Uh, and and as it turns Ed, out, this works great. And um, Ed demoed that on the TED stage with the diaper, the materials yeah, of the right. diaper. Yeah, that's right. the that same polymer out. as in diapers. And so expansion this was microscopy is when you blow something up mm -hmm. to uh, that's smaller, blow it up to make it easier for you to analyze and, and do uh, uh, photograph it. Yeah, and image it. Image yes. it, yeah. yeah. So, and then uh, this was initially just sort of a thought experiment about okay, what if you did that in reverse, right? What if instead of taking something you want to see and making it bigger, why don't you take something and pattern it bigger? and then make it smaller. And more importantly, what's that even good for, right? Yeah. You know, this crazy idea of shrinking things down. Um, 
But what we realized is this actually has quite a lot of benefits, even beyond the shrink itself, because there's an analog here between uh, what nanofabrication was and what it could be in the future. In that once you have this scaffold, like the one in expansion microscopy, what you can do is you can create things in a volume, right? As opposed to having to have it all connected or anything like that. Uh, so whereas nanofabrication was predicated on a planar deposition where you create a mask and then you deposit material and then you do that over and over again to build something, um, we're taking uh, what was an imaging technology for imaging in three dimensions, turning that on its head to do patterning, which people have already done, but more importantly, doing it inside of one of these scaffolds that lets you shrink it down. So it's a bit like the difference between like a paper cutout and a painting, um, in, for, but in 3D, whereas in 2D, in, if you wanna make a painting, you have this canvas, and this is a bit like a two-dimensional scaffold, mm -hmm. let's say. Yeah. And you can apply different amounts of paint, so you can create gradients. Uh, the paint doesn't need to be connected to each other, it can be separate from one another, um, and you can put down different colors, and that's almost like putting down different materials. Mm -hmm. um, whereas with a paper cutout, you s sort of have to have everything connected together. It's sort of hard to have like multiple different materials. You'd have to be like actually going in and grafting it together so it's supporting and connected. Um, so we wanted to do that for the third dimension. And that brought us to this idea of volumetric deposition. Whereas when we make transistors, we rely on something called the planar process, which is planar deposition. So in order to extend that into the third dimension, we have this scaffold to be able to do volumetric deposition. And then, so teach us about <clears throat> the actual scaffold. There's a hydrogel yeah. involved, teach, yeah. so teach us about that, how so you shrink that So a hydrogel, you can sort of think of it as a bowl of spaghetti in water where all the spaghetti is sort of connected to each other in this big network. And in the case of this hydrogel, that spaghetti has a whole bunch of different chemical groups on it that are negatively charged, so they repel each other. So that's what causes it to expand and, and like holds that open, right? And then you can infuse a small dye, actually, and then wherever you zap that with light, it'll stick to the spaghetti, and that forms an anchor. It actually is a bit like a latent image in photography where you've, you create this initial image in three dimensions, and then what you can do is go in afterwards and develop it into whatever material you want through volumetric deposition. Okay, and then when, as I'm, as I'm, uh, your, 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 the anchor points mm -hmm. are then you're attaching, a, a, you're shining light, so it, so it attaches. Attaches. And then afterwards, we can deposit on those anchor points yes. using nanoparticles or other uh, water-based chemistry, where you just sort of like wash something on and it either sticks or then grows at the point where you've put all these anchors. And what would be an example of a material that you would want to anchor onto? Um, so the ones we've demonstrated are uh, silver for making conductors and semiconducting uh, uh, nanocrystals as well. So, and then because we're again using this expansion microscopy uh, hydrogel, you can then actually add acid or salt and then it shrinks down um, by a factor of 10 or more actually um, linearly, which is, you know, we can go as much as a million fold volumetric. Wow. Um, and once you've finished with that process, it's actually dehydrated. So it's actually a resistor. It's like a dielectric material which you now have conductors and potentially also semiconductors embedded inside of. Holy cow. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so let me see let me see if I can paraphrase again. So you have like a bowl of interconnected spaghetti in water and then you have the um, the the the, ang the hydrogel enables you to add the anchor points mm -hmm. and shine the material. Well, the dye the is the dye. When you pattern it, it creates those anchor points. The dye creates the anchor points. Yeah, it sticks to the spaghetti. It, sti it sticks and to that, the spaghetti. And that's like an intermediate that then lets you put other material there. So it's like yes. a meatball then can stick to it. Sure, sure. And yes, then when yes. you remove all the water, all the meatballs exactly. can come together. And you used acid or salt. Yes. Okay, and then that can shrink it by 10 or more fold down mm -hmm. to potentially even well, a Well, actually any amount, anywhere fold. from between two to 
uh, now even like 40 fold. So are, we're talking like taking like a bowl, like an actual bowl of spaghetti and turning that into like less than a grain of sand. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then you can embed uh, potentially computational capacity into that Absolutely. something that's less than a grain of sand. Absolutely. And then is that uh, mostly like seeming to be used for computational purposes? Well, I think there's many, many different applications here. You can take it in so many different directions since really what we've done is just expand the design space for what can be made to have nanoscale resolution and also useful materials, right? So as a result, there's lots of things you can do. You could make traditional computers potentially. Um, the things I'm most excited about are the light-based applications. So 3D printing optics, lenses um, that are super, super thin but very powerful. Um, or even uh, it's been shown you can make these optical neural networks. So we could pattern optical neural networks. And then you know if you expand that even further, you could imagine maybe even making minds that function based off of light. Okay, before we get to all of those things, yeah. how do we actually make that bowl of spaghetti into like something that's like an optic? An how optic. Would, yeah, how would you... Well, in this like case, the thing you're causing to stick to the backbone of the hydrogel is something that causes light to bend. Oh. So you just control either the geometry of where you put the material that causes light to bend or the concentration, because you can also just change the laser intensity when you're trying to pattern it, and you can ch control how much of it it is. And that's called a gradient optic, actually. Yeah. Which traditionally have been very, very hard to make, um, and you never really had much geometric control, but now we have essentially complete geometric control. Okay, and then with this complete geometric control, you're able to add um, whatever it may be for processing capacity or for optical capacity, mm -hmm. to the, and then you're shrinking it, and you're looking to add other materials, you're looking to see if this can be used for, you said, crazy things like yeah, optics computation. Also, you said, what, what did you, you said, uh, photonic computing, optical neural networks, minds made out of light. Okay, let's unpack these one at a time. So, what would what would a, a what would a an, um, something that's at the nanoscale of an optic? How would that yeah be used? How would that be used? So, um, one simple case is just making lenses that are much smaller and much better. Um, you know, when you stick a lens on your camera, it's, you know, sometimes this long, you know, sometimes even this long, right? But there's, the only reason it needs to be that long is you need to have like the curvature of the lens and it needs to be of a certain size to be able to collect that light. But each one of those lenses induces certain kinds of aberration. So then you need more lenses to correct for those in order to shape and sculpt the light to be just right once it like hits your sensor or a piece of film. But when you have this sort of nanoscale control um, and these materials that can bend light quite a lot, you can then architect all those functions from all those different lens elements all into one very, very thin plane. Okay, so the amount of yeah, space that we need in order to have the optic make the mm -hmm. capturing of, of the mm -hmm. image and then that we could embed the ability to be able to maybe send that constant stream of what you're capturing to the yeah. cloud to, to our... Yeah, you could do that with you know electronics for capturing it at the back. Um, you could also, uh, one of the cooler papers that came out recently is they actually 3D printed these grids that diffract light in different ways and they have multiple layers of them and each layer is actually the layer in a neural network. So each layer is doing computation on that light. So you can wow. have sensors on this side and then an object on the other side and it'll do the machine vision to say, is that a shoe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, wow. With this, so within the actual yeah. optical imagery. But that was done with microwaves, so much longer wavelengths. Um, but I could do that with optical wavelengths. Um, the visible spectrum, which is how we view the world, so maybe also how we would want these uh, things to understand the world. Whoa. Okay. So we're so we're talking things at the at the at the nano scale, um, almost nano scale is invisible to the human eye. Absolutely, it yeah. is. Yeah. So the, about the smallest thing a human eye can see is roughly, I think, ten microns. With if you just hit catch the light just right, and this is 
Let's see, about three orders of magnitude less than that. Three orders of magnitude. A little so more than that. It's a actually. billionth of a meter? Uh, it's 10 to the negative nine. Yeah, yeah, okay. I think yeah. so. Yeah, okay, ish. Yeah, yeah. So, so, then, so then when you embed this thing that these nanotechs that are, you know, basically you know, invisible, they are invisible to the human eye, then I'm so crazy to, to think for, for us animals that you can somehow put optical technology, processing technology embedded in something that's that small when we've had these massive computers that, yeah, I mean, they've gotten a lot well, smaller. It's crazy in some senses, but you look at biology and it's already doing all that sort of stuff. So this is not new. It's just that we, you know, with our big hands fumbling around, can't build it, right? So we're finally being able to understand how to manipulate matter um, to a greater and greater degree. So we're starting to actually be able to do some of the same things that biology can. Um, and I think that's actually one of the really exciting things about maybe now having a rapid prototyping um, approach to doing nanofabrication is you can maybe even have some sort of synthetic evolution where you can create you know, tens of thousands or millions of variations on a structure um, very, very quickly. And like in uh, evolution, naturally, or in this case, I guess, unnaturally select for the ones that work the best and just keep doing that. So you can, instead of trying to you know, understand everything and optimize it, um, to be perfect in our heads or in our computers, instead impose the design constraints for the function that we want, and then just sort of like guide the formation of the structures that are best able to do that. Yeah, yeah, that type of figuring out what, uh, letting the, um, this directed evolution find the best fit is, mm -hmm. uh, and like you said, it's already happening um, all the, the crazy processes that are happening within our bodies that mm -hmm. we can't necessarily see. I mean, in some ways, evolution already happens in our bodies. There's something called somatic hypermutation, which is how our active immune system works. It's actually actively rejiggering genes to create antibodies that'll recognize whatever foreign intruders are there and selecting for the ones that best bind and then producing more of those in order to then recognize, let's say, you know, a bacteria or a virus. Yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. It's like the, con the constant <laughs> computing of, of what's mm -hmm. happening within us in, in, in regard to the environments that we're in and how to best survive in them. Um, and so then, so then when, you, when you do a directed evolution with a, like a, with a synthetic uh, neurobiology, what would, that, what would that like look like? Well, it really depends what you're trying to make, right? Um, in the case of like optics, for instance, you're talking about creating structures smaller than the wavelength of light, but which perform some operation on that light. Um, so what you could do is you could just pattern many, many variations of this structure and see how that affects the light. And then you can build like a catalog of all these things that do different operations on the light and then start combining those and seeing what sort of functions you can create from that and iterating on that. And maybe all the while taking the measurements and seeing what these structures are and using that data to then um, do something like machine learning to then figure out what is the topology of this space and maybe then more generatively inside of a computer just output the functional that you care about just by telling it what you want. And, and then at the same time not understanding how any of it works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so does, it, does it seem like the nano fabrication um, is going to be, um, uh, that we're going to be doing this process more often with, 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 the sh with embedding um, what we want, optics, computing, and then shrinking? Is that, is that possible? It's possible. That's, that's one approach to doing it, to getting the resolution is through the shrink. But it's unclear that the real demand here is in resolution, rather just this new expansion of the design space to be able to create gradients, to be able to pattern multiple materials in three dimensions, and to be able to do it at really, really high resolutions mm -hmm. um, is incredibly powerful. And also in any single, any geometry you can imagine, because it's all embedded in a scaffold. It doesn't need to be connected. It doesn't need to be supported. 
um, or anything like that. So that really just like blows things open to some degree. Um, and even if you don't really shrink, you could still use this for doing some very powerful fabrication. Um, and that adding that level of shrink just lets you get that resolution down, which is good for some applications. This s seems to be uh, one of the many uh, exponential technologies. Uh, what nano what na nanotech feels like is going to permeate everything as well, kind of like artificial intelligence. Everything is in, v v in tons of ways just shrinking in terms of its size, mm -hmm. shrinking in terms of its uh, capacity capabilities, and hopefully it's going to make it easier for us to, to, to live in, our, in, in the world. Yeah, I think there's a bit more than that. I think, you know, when you can build things um, that are closer and closer to what we see in nature and in biology, okay. you can in turn start, um, A, doing the same sorts of amazing things that biology already does at the nanoscale, but also in turn create things that are more and more integrated with biological systems as well. Yes, like okay. One thing okay. that's kind of funny about my process is that um, I had this huge issue of E. coli eating my nanostructures. <laughs> They were too delicious. <laughs> so it's very pile compatible. I had to start adding antibiotics oh, to whoa. prevent that from happening. So, okay, so one, so one of the things that I think you, you just pointed out that's really interesting is there's all these complicated biological processes that have been evolving on Earth for billions of years. Mm -hmm. And so now we're kind of looking at the catalog of biological processes, identifying which ones we want to work with the kind of like the electronics era that, uh, mm -hmm. that we're building and figuring out how to blend these and shrink and really get them down in size and scale but increase in capacity for applied to our everyday lives. Yeah. Well, I think we'll see a blurring of what we consider technology and what we consider biology. Yeah. I, I, there's no reason that those are distinct things. It's just, you know, biology happened on its own, but now we are starting to wrest control over that. But then also these more synthetic approaches like what I've done as well as what nanofabrication has done um, in order to create uh, structures and understand what we're making and, and do it smaller and smaller and have more and more control. And, you know, at some point these things might converge, you know. You know, biology is this amazing uh, way in which it can have like a code like DNA and from that it is then able to generate the huge amounts of complexity of structure and function that it can and it, you know, builds itself, right, um, using that information. In turn, when we get enough control over these synthetic systems, you could also imagine building, you know, micro machines that can, you know, have some embedded code in them that then allows them to also reproduce themselves to create, again, another form of sort of synthetic evolution or self-assembly, and that's, more akin to biology. Yeah, and that's super intelligence. In I don't many, know, maybe. In, in many ways, it feels like it's all pointing in the direction of super intelligence. I like how you said that, you know, we, that technology is, is part of biology. It's what biology created technology, but it's all together in the lines of blurring more and more. Um, teach us about digital transcendence and singularity. Oh, you mean these uh, art pieces that I made? Yeah, yeah. So and what it means for, yeah, the... Yeah, well, yeah. a long time ago, um, right when the transition from uh, like analog photography into digital photography was happening, I thought a lot about um, mediums and how mediums have some intrinsic quality to them. It's not that necessarily one is better, all it is is that they're different, you know. Back then people were like, oh digital, that's crap, we're gonna stick with film and darkroom prints are always better, which we've seen is not really necessarily the case. They're different and they have different qualities to them. And um, I thought this was sort of similar to some of the same thoughts going on in uh, Silicon Valley and uh, how you know, one could upload their mind to the cloud or um, perhaps you know, technology becomes a singularity, but that's also a transition into a digital medium from an analog medium, right? So I created these pieces that sort of questioned that. I, I came up with a, a process by which you can uh, create an image using light, but that image um, falls apart into the digital medium. It begins to break apart into these maze structures because the light itself 
is right on the edge of what the sensor can sense. So it confuses the algorithms that create that image, that take that information and compose it into an image. And as a result, you end up with this image that is both of the thing that existed in the analog world, but is now um, also an image of the algorithm, which then made that transition into the digital world. And I imagine, you know, if we end up uploading our minds, for instance, you're going to see that same sort of transition. Even if you can imagine understanding the brain perfectly up to like 99.99999%. And you imagine that every, you know, microsecond you're doing a computation. If that, that last tiny bit, if that over the entire brain just keeps happening over and over and over again in the simulation, you could very, very, very quickly just divert from being human for that tiny, tiny difference. Because over time, it's the, the way things function will just very, very quickly change because the medium with which it's embedded is just oh so slightly different. And that's only if it's oh so slightly different. It probably would be very different. Interesting. Your thoughts on mediums, I think, and the way that there's a difference between the analog and the digital and it w and to do something like be able to upload uh, and what comes with that process, what fidelity comes with that process. Mm -hmm. It's complicated, it's such a complicated, f it's so hard to even wrap our minds around what that process is like. We don't know what's happening here. How do mm -hmm. we even upload that? In thinking of mediums as having some intrinsic aesthetic and maybe meaning in their own, um, one of the projects I've started working on involves uh, thinking about the ocean and the communication that occurs there. Where in the ocean, the two primarily modes of communication are sound and light. You see a lot of bioluminescence and you see a lot of like auditory communication. So I was thinking, all right, can we combine these two into a singular medium for expression? And as it turns out, there's these uh, algae that when you perturb them mechanically, they light up, right? You can go swimming in these bioluminescent bays and everywhere you move, it lights up around you. So the thought here was you can actually use waves of sound to mechanically perturb these algae and cause them to light up. And the cool thing about sound is it's a wave, right? So you can actually do holography with it. So you could potentially even control like how all the si uh, sound waves cancel each other out or constructively interfere, like I was talking with Light earlier, to create an image in three dimensions, which is then um, inducing the emission of light by these uh, biological organisms. Um, and just trying to use this as a medium to communicate maybe some of the more profound struggles uh, that the ocean is now facing with you know, ocean acidification, as well as all the plastic that's just completely demolishing ecosystems. And that's not to say, you know, global warming, heating things up is also taking a huge toll as well. Um, so maybe, you know, you can have a representation of that um, embedded in the mediums of communication that are intrinsic to the ocean. Yeah, yeah, to, to be able to kind of see the health bar of what's going on. Yeah, in a, in a visual or at least way. communicate it and uh, maybe move people. Yeah. Yeah, move people into into action. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So much of what we do is on that engaging and inspiring side of things, and and the work that's that's happening right now is this place, it, MIT Media Lab is just popping. I mean, the, well, this is just the stuff you see. This is the tip of the iceberg. Then there's the rest of MIT, which you don't see. But you know, a lot of that work is extremely foundational. Yeah. This it, is just the yeah. stuff that percolates up into the, the, the public eye. The public you know? eye, yeah, yeah. The one that actually gets talked about through the media versus the stuff, like you said, is the mm -hmm. bottom of the iceberg. All, all of what is you know, happening here as you walk down you know, the halls is you know, how much of these processes are happening in Tel Aviv or in Shenzhen or in London, et cetera, around the world. How many of these you know, groups are working on tackling some of the, the, the edge of knowledge innovations? Well, obviously there's people all over the world working on these problems and they're all doing fantastic jobs of it. But I think there's something to be said for concentration. When you take enough minds working on these sorts of problems and just stick them all in a very close space, um, something very special happens, right? 
the serendipity of interaction takes over and you start seeing people, you know, taking disciplines that were separate and they just collide to create something completely new. And I think that's one of the things that the Media Lab has done a pretty good job of, is uh, taking disparate, disparate uh, disciplines and just, just completely blurring the lines all together, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's like it, yeah, it's like when you look at the edge of knowledge and you find two fields that's and then where where is that uh, where do those edges come into a, a, a of a vert of, to another vertex and yeah. then when you when you keep pushing when you blur those lines and keep pushing that edge then you have all of the innovation that happens yeah, in that exactly. field new yeah. fields emerge new even, children get even into in my case like I took technologies that already exist and just combined them in a way that nobody had really thought of because uh, we had this realization of what the ideal form of nanofabrication might be and we surveyed the landscape for what existed and what we could use and then put them together and as it turns out that involved taking elements from bi uh, uh, biological engi engineering all the conjugation chemistries it involved taking this new form of microscopy that ed had ed and um, his uh, students had invented expansion microscopy as well as these new ways of doing lithography in three dimensions which came out of um, initially biological imaging but then started getting applied to nanofabrication as well so you know, no one of those disciplines on its own could have done it, right? It's, it's really how things collide to create something entirely new. Yeah, you had it yourself uh, as an experience, and you're right. You're putting together the minds at a place like Media Lab. It's inevitable that you, in such a great concentration, there's going to be more and more cool mm -hmm. edges pushed and, and ideas created. Um, let's ask you a couple of the simulation questions on the okay. way out. The first question is, are we in a simulation? Um, well, honestly, I don't really care whether I'm in a simulation or not, is sort of my answer. It's sort of irrelevant to me. If you're living your life such that when you find out the simulation is real, you're going to change, then you're probably living your life wrong. If you're content with what you're doing inside of a simulation, then you'll be great, right? It does, it, it, the whole point is like where you derive meaning. I think one of the interesting things is today we have like this crisis of like spirituality or meaning in our lives, um, largely because a lot of people have uh, broken away from our traditional um, like religious institutions and things like that, which initially had given us a lot of meaning. So now we're in an, a place where, you know, it's very easy to feel like there is no meaning, but once you take that and you accept that maybe there is no meaning, then the only meaning that matters is that which you create for yourself. So if you were to live in a simulation, how would you live your life? Creating maybe your own meaning. Yeah, that's a, that's a good answer. We. We, we, we ask the question a lot to, to probe about how people you know, think in general and, and mm -hmm. that's a, it's interesting that you tie meaning into the simulation question and, um, and we gain so much of our fulfillment in our lives by uh, setting some sort of a, of a massive goal that we want to achieve mm -hmm. and, you know, and taking a burden and going towards that goal and um, you know, continuing to level up in the game and then also potentially making our own simulations mm -hmm. and there's so much other cool yeah, stuff absolutely. to... absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You'll, you, I'm sure Media Labs are already uh, deep into simulation territory and there's going to be a <laughs> lot more that, that is wow. <laughs> done. Now, I definitely walk around here and it's a bit reminiscent of Black Mirror, I can tell you that much. Sometimes, sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's some positive, you know, uh, the potentials as well. Well, of course. Uh, yeah, of know. course, yeah. 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 There, everybody Look likes to talk image. about that There's an image right now on that screen of a Matrix figure. Yeah. Yeah, that was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, at, right exactly. we're talking about simulation so, so we're in the Matrix, that's yeah. the correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> and Dan, last question is, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Well, I mean, my answer is, is light. That's what I have found, you know, all the art I've ever created was, you know, for me to like just both communicate as well as experience um, the beauty of light and what can be made from and uh, experienced through light. Yeah. That's the first time we've heard light as the answer to the most beautiful thing in the world. Yeah, wow. Yeah. 
Yeah, for someone that spent you know decade plus uh, immersed in <laughs> in light. Well, I think one of the ironic things is back in the days when we worked in the dark room, in order to create things from light, you had to deprive yourself from it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I actually spent a lot of time in rooms that are completely pitch black in order to develop film and things like that, and it gives you a very different um, appreciation, I think, for light. And you begin to understand what it means to be blind also. And to have to always have a map of your entire surroundings in your head. A different kind of simulation. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> a, a, literally a map that Yeah, has, it's a simulation yeah. of what's around you in three-dimensional space yes, without correct. that visual input. Without the visual input, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, that was a really strong end, and it, this has been such a solid and enlightening conversation. Thank you so much for coming onto the show, Dan. Thank you for having me. <laughs> really, really appreciate it. Yeah. Holy cow. There's so much work that you guys are doing here that's fascinating and at the edge, and I'm like a little child trying to understand it and hopefully help other people get inspired and engaged with it. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks to everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking about subjects like art, tech, uh, light, and nanotechnology as well. Also, find the links below to Dan's work. Go and support him, support the Synthetic Neurobiology Group, the MIT Media Lab, follow them, follow their work as well, and support the artists and entrepreneurs and organizations around the world that you believe in. Support simulation, our links are below so you can do cool things like continue coming on site and conducting awesome interviews like this. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace.